Well, I'd like to welcome y'all here this morning. <clears throat> we'll begin the service. We'll sing number 327, Sweet Hour of Prayer. <clears throat> I believe I'll mention in the beginning of the service here, at our last business meeting, we talked about and we voted that we would have our have a meal here next Sunday, and some of y'all may not have been here and you may not have heard it. Uh, I was reminded this morning that we might need to make that announcement. So we will have a meal here after church next Sunday, and you're welcome to be here. Just bring some food and enjoy being together. The song that we just sung there, Sweet Hour of Prayer, there's a lot that can be said in that, and there's a lot of sweet communications that we can have with our Lord and Savior throughout all things. It says there, but there was something there that caught my attention. He says, to him whose truth and faithfulness Engage the waiting soul to bless. 
And since he bids me seek his face, believe his word, and trust his grace. And that's the last part of that is something that we need to keep in our mind constantly. To believe his word. And what is his word? It is right here. Right here in this book is the word of God. The word of Jesus Christ, his gospel, that he has recorded for us to read, to listen to, and to believe. And he will also communicate with us through prayer. And he can show us and he will tell us. And he says, I chasten and rebuke those that I love. And he'll give us victory in the end. But he can show us and he'll write the things in our hearts how he'd have for us to live and what he'd have for us to do. And we can read through all manner of things where people went to him and asked him certain things. And he was able to communicate with them. He was able to tell them what to do and how to do. And he is there for us today. And we'll be able to do the same thing. I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. He says, wait upon the Lord. Don't be too quick. Don't try to take things into our own hands, but to wait upon him. To put our faith to put our trust in him and wait I say upon him our Lord and our Savior to give us all that we need spiritually and he will and there is nothing that can come upon us but what there is a way for us to go through it there is a way for us to escape there is a way for each and every one of us to see victory You're not born to be a loser. You have the opportunity to win in this. Paul said that he did not fight as one that just beat at the air, but he was fighting for victory. And he's talking about that spiritual fight. He wanted to make his licks count. He wanted to live in accordance with with the Word of God and how that He had been taught by revelation, by Jesus Christ teaching Him. That is how Paul was able to do the things that he did. And I know that it's, He is there and He is waiting just as much for you and I today as He was for Paul. And we can have that same spirit, we can have the same power, we can have the same understanding that the men that wrote this book had. Because God was the one that inspired those words to give to them to write. And God is the one today that can put it into your mind and inspire you with his word. And his peace, I'll give to you that comforter. I'll give to you peace, hope, eternal life and I hope and pray that that's what we've all come out here for today to learn and to understand more about his word and as we read through just keep in mind of what he's saying believe upon his word and trust in his grace believe upon his word and then trust him he has said what he would do and trust him to fulfill it. I've turned here this morning to Matthew and this is the Sermon on the Mount, the fifth chapter of Matthew. 
There's a tremendous amount in these next three verses here of, of him telling his people as he was here upon the earth, it was, a, it was a time that he was there giving people information. He was telling them how that they needed to live their life and what he would do for them. And let's start at the first verse, fifth chapter of Matthew. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Jesus Christ. Visualize these things. Get it in your mind here. And just think about, even in our day today, that we're about to start reading words that Jesus Christ spoke. And we will have a few things to say about what he had said. And let him give us the understandings of his words here and what he was talking about as he was preaching and teaching to this group of people. But here he was standing upon this maybe high hill in a place where the people could sit down in front of him. Very much like today that I am standing here in this pulpit and I can look down and see and you can see me. But he was there preaching and teaching the words that his father was given to him. And we will be preaching and teaching the words that he left here for us to be able to read and to understand today. Realizing and knowing that it is the word of God that Jesus Christ spoke and that we can read and understand it today. And I must believe upon that in its entirety. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those, he says, that's poor in spirit, in, in the worldly spirit but rich in the Spirit of God, the way I look at that. He says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's, that is the only people that will be able to inherit that kingdom of heaven is those that is, has been filled with the Spirit of the Holy Ghost while they were here upon the earth. He says there is no others, there is none that will enter into that kingdom that he's talking about that is defiled with sin. How can we have that taken away? Only through Jesus Christ our Lord. How can our sins be forgiven? Only through Him. We have to see how poor and wretched and blind that we are in our own self. And that we can be able to see by the light of Jesus Christ. And that we can then be rich spiritually by His power, by His grace, not by our works, but by His grace. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I believe that there He's talking about mourning our lost condition, that terrible condition that we are in, and that we are so weak and undone without Him. But when we see that and we mourn that and we then we flee to Jesus Christ. He is there then to forgive us. He is there to lift us up. He is there to give us that righteous spirit. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. Those that see their sad condition and they mourn over that. And they beg for help from Jesus Christ. They will be comforted. He has promised that. This is, this is the words of Jesus Christ. You shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Again, meek in our own self, seeing that who are we, but we are nothing. 
And we have to totally rely upon God the Father. We can never have an arrogant, forward spirit within us. We must be in a meek, lowly condition, showing that we have nothing of our own, but we have it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He says, you shall inherit the earth. And what's he talking about there? Inheriting the earth. There will be a thousand year period that the righteous will inherit this earth. They will be brought back here to the earth to be here with Jesus Christ for a thousand year period. And this earth will not be like it is now. It will be a, a good place to be. There will be no sin upon this earth at that time. And we will be here in a saved condition with Jesus Christ. I don't know what all will go on, but I know it will be a good thing, a good place. And I believe that we will all be at one together with Jesus Christ. And he says, those that are meek and has all of these others, all of these attributes will be in the righteous. He says, they will inherit the earth. They'll be able to be here for a thousand years in that wonderful condition. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I want you to think about that just a minute. What did he just say? What did Jesus say? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. <coughs> they shall be filled. Other places he talks about throughout the Bible, he says, don't take thought for the things of this world. For God clothes the ravens and he does all the other things that are beautiful here upon the earth. And he says, will he not more give to you? What he's saying here is, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. So that is first and foremost in our mind, in our heart. That is first and foremost in the righteous. That they are putting that ahead of everything that they are thirsting and they are seeking after righteousness. They did not come here. Now they have received that spirit. And now they're saying, well, I'm going to just go on and live like the world. Not at all. They've received that Spirit. They have that blessed peace within them. They have that comforter within them. And now they are hungering and thirsting. They are seeking on how can I live a righteous life like God did in Jesus Christ while He was here upon the earth. And it will not be your works that is doing that, but you will allow the Spirit of the Holy Ghost in you to be able to do that. You will be seeking out the will of that Spirit within you instead of the Spirit of the flesh. They are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, not after the things of this world, but after righteousness. For they shall be filled with righteousness. Not with the things of the world, but with righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Be merciful to all people, mankind. And he says God will extend his mercy. Look at the mercy that he's extended to you and me if we've received that. He has taken away our sins. They are no more when we, need, when we should have been cast into hell by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the love and mercy of God. You can have that peace. You can have righteousness within you. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
Ask yourself, how can I be pure in heart? All of these things come from one place, Jesus Christ. How can you have a pure heart when we came here with a wicked heart? That new birth. That birth that Nicodemus did not understand at all. Believing these words, trusting in His grace. Believe His word and trust in His grace. It's what He's talking about here right now. I'm telling you these things, He says. Now believe in them. Blessed are the pure and heartfelt. They shall see God. Do you want to stand before Him today? In your condition, the condition that you are in right now today, do you want to stand before God and let Him judge you? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Where is your heart today? Is it filled with the things of the world? Is it filled with hate? Is it filled with greed? Is it filled with lust? That's not it. Those things are not in that pure heart. That heart that has been made new will have all of that taken away and be able to overcome it. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. And friends, he is talking about being the peacemakers with God. Making peace spiritually. Because remember, when we came here, we are at odds with God. We came here in a lost condition. We came here in an undone condition. So we are at odds with him. So now, there is a way we've got to go to Him and make peace with God the Father. And that can only be done through Jesus Christ. And He says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We talk about quite often that when we receive this new spirit, then we become a son of God. That we can inherit the kingdom of God. We are now there with Jesus, Jesus Christ, a Son of God. And He's telling us how that happens. It's making peace with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. For they shall be called the children of God. Is that where you are today? Are you still walking in sin? Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he was just going on and he was telling people, and he tells us in other places where, the, yes, if you are a righteous person, if you have laid aside the things of this world you will not be able to walk in that anymore you will have to separate from the things of this world you will have to separate from sin even though man might look upon it as everything is okay if it goes against his word here it is sin and we can have nothing to do with it we cannot encourage anybody in sin in any way, shape, or form. Just to smile with somebody or our presence may encourage someone in something that goes in direct opposition to what he's saying here. And you may, it may cause persecutions to be brought upon you. The Word of God through Jesus Christ brought persecutions upon him so much that they put him to death. 
and others that you can read about his disciples they went out and they preached the word of God and it brought great tribulations great persecutions against them because they preached the truth and he says blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven he encourages, he tells people in every one of these situations, what has he done? He has told us certain things there that would happen to the righteous, that the righteous must do, that we, if we want to be a part of that, but then he tells us all about in these things, that they shall be filled with righteousness, that the mercy of God will be upon them. They will be called the children of God. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Look at the encouragement that he's given to us today. To follow his word. His word. To follow it. To live by it. Not for us. To live by our own self and to live by the lust of the things of this world. But to live in accordance with his word. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He says, blessed are those people. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. If these things come upon you, he says, if these persecutions come upon you and, you, and, and people say all manner of evil things against you falsely because you are following him for Jesus' sake, because you're following Jesus, he says rejoice and be ex exceedingly glad and why would that be? Because that then is a confirmation that we are walking with Him. And that's what He's telling us. For great is your reward in heaven. You'll be suffering these things here upon the earth. And people may look down upon you. But what is He? What are we looking for? Are we looking for... The praises of man here upon the earth? Or are we looking for that great reward from God in heaven? For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And this man Jesus Christ that was speaking these things knew, knew the greatest persecution. There has nobody that's lived upon the earth ever gone through all the persecutions that he went through. And he went through it, never reviling against man. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, is what he said. Even though he was there hanging in the, on that cross, for you, my friend, will you hear his word and harden not your heart as they did in the provocation. Will you hear His word today and not let Satan come and take it away out of your mind? But let it furnish that good ground that it might bring forth good fruit in you, spiritual fruit, that you can have eternal life and inherit the kingdom of heaven. You're the salt of the earth. But if you have lost his savor, but if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. You're the salt of the, salt of the world. 
the earth. Maintain that through following Jesus Christ, walking close to Him. He says, if, you, if the salt has lost its Savior, they used that salt to prepare meat, to preserve it, so that they could keep it right on till it was good for them to be able to use. That Spirit of the Lord is what makes us the salt of the earth. And it will preserve your spirit as long as you want Him to be there. But if the salt was used and it is good for one time, and then it had to be cast out and it was good for nothing but to just cast it out and to cast it under the feet of men. But it was good to preserve that meat for as long as it needed to be done. And that Spirit of God is there to preserve your spirit as long as you want it to be there. He will be there and He will abide with you. Don't let Satan deceive you. Don't let him try to take, tear you down and take you away. You're the light of the world. That Spirit of the Holy Ghost should be shining. It is the light of the world. The world is in darkness. The world is in wickedness. And when we look around today, we are living in such a wicked and evil and adulterous generation. Everywhere you look, there is sin abounds. Everywhere. Where can you see the light? There is one place that that light is shining bright, and that is in Jesus Christ. And there is one. There is another place that that light is shining, and that is in all of and that has that He has given that new birth. That light is shining. He says, "You're the light of the world. You are the light that the world can be able to see what He is doing in you." And give God the honor and the glory for it. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And if that spirit is growing within you, is it, is it prevalent in your life? Is it so that people see that there is something different in your life? And he is not walking or she is not walking with the lust of the things of this world and in the things of the world, but walking in righteousness as he talked about there a while ago. That Jesus said, and he said now, that you're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. You want that light to shine. You want others to be able to see. And for them... To have the same thing if they will just seek, you, seek Him. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. God gives us that light. Now what are we going to do with it? He says you don't take that light if you go into a room in our day, we would go in and flip a switch on and there's a light, there's a lamp or something there. When we cut that on, we cut it on so that all the people might be able to see. Lots of times you may go in someone's home and you might sit down and they, they will come to you and say, let us cut a light on so that we can see. And they cut a light on and now there's light in that room and you can see all in there and you can see one another and you can communicate one with the other because that light has illuminated it. And that's what he's talking about for us spiritually. He says, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. God didn't give you that light, that new spirit, to cover it up and to not do anything with it so that others cannot see that at all. He gave you that light so that now it might illuminate and then you might be able then to communicate with others and others may be able to see 
Just as you might walk in there and cut that light on and say, let us have some light. I hear people say that. Let's cut the light on so it'll be light in here. How about that spiritual light that's within you? Do you want that? Let's cut that light on so that there'll be spiritual light that you might be able to understand, you might be able to see, and you might be able to grow spiritually and help someone on their journey. Let not let your light so sh- let your light so shine before men. Exactly what we're talking about, and I just quoted this basically. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Not glorifying you for what your works are, for those good works. Because let me tell you something. A righteous person will bring forth good works. Now you can try to downgrade that. You can try to say all manner of things against it. But his word, listen to what he says. Let your light so shine before others that others may see your good works. If it is evil works, if it is sinful works in you, it is not of God. But it is of sin, it is of Satan. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's how you are able to do those works. Not on your own. This is the words of Jesus Christ. Do you believe it? Let your light so shine before men. And what's he talking about? Let your life, let your works, the things that you do, the things that you say, your words, where you go, how you dress, and everything that you do, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now the only people that can have the works in that light, he's talking, let that light shine. That is the light of the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. Without that, you are doing a work that is not righteous and that will not shine and will not be good works. But you've got the opportunity for that to happen. You're the light of the world. And a city that is on a hill cannot be hid. I want you to listen to that one more time. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. The works of Jesus Christ in you. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And I believe that what he's talking about here is is false teachers antichrist whatever he says whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments the things that god is telling his people and how he tells them that they should live their life and shall teach men so teaching false doctrine shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven they will not have a part of that in the kingdom of heaven. They will be called least. The people in the kingdom of heaven will not be looking upon them as the righteous at all. But whosoever, and he talks about another group here, now whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall shall do and teach them, The commandments of God is what he's talking about. Shall do, he said. What does that relate to when you do something? That goes back 
to your works. He says, whosoever shall do and teach them. Do and teach the commandments of God, the Word of God, how He would have for us to live. The same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven because they have that spirit of righteousness within them. They are doing a righteous work here upon the earth. For I say unto you that except your righteousness, listen to what he's talking about, that righteousness within you, that I say unto you except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now what was the scribes and the Pharisees teaching? They were still holding on to the law and they were still teaching all manner of things that they had added to the law. They had added to the things that God had given to, to, and had told people how to live way back under Moses and even before that. But these people in their self-righteous ways had changed the word and had talked and told, had all manner of laws and, and things that you must do to please them. And this is what he's saying. That your righteousness must be greater, must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. They were self-righteous in their own way. The people that he's been talking about here, that he has talked about being blessed, are those that are righteous because they have had that new birth. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's the ones that he's talking about here. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no case, in no case, he said, enter into the kingdom of heaven. What is within you today? Is that righteous spirit in you today and growing? Is it illuminated? Is that a light there that people can see? What are your works today that you are doing? You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. Now he's going to go over and he's going to talk about some of the things there that what he is telling people to do. <coughs> but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Reka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. He's talking about, the way I look at this, he's talking about brothers. He's talking about people proclaiming to be Christian, to be claiming to know the truth. But he says there that at whosoever shall say, Thou fool, a righteous person, but one calling a righteous person a fool shall be in danger of hell fire. It's the way I look at that and the way I feel like that's what he's talking about. But we should never say that God's work here is a foolish work. But we better be sure that we are aligned with him and not something that man has gotten up. And that man is saying that it is okay to do this. And he puts his stamp of approval on it, but it's not the stamp of God's approval on it. Leave therefore thy therefore if there is therefore if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Go to your brother if you have a problem. Go to him and reconcile these things to him. Don't hold grudges 
and look, up, look down upon someone. But go to them, discuss the problem, and come away with it reconciled. Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the offer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost father. Agree with thine adversary. Agree with Jesus Christ quickly. He is an adversary against sin in us. Now agree with Him. Agree with His Word. Quickly, He says, whilst you are in the way with Him. Remember what He said? We talk about it quite often, but the church is there in Revelations, in 2 and 3 Revelations there that He talked about, and He told them to... Uh, now... Here is what is wrong. He says, now repent and overcome. Repent and overcome these sins by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. And that's what he was saying. He, he was talking to them. Repent while you are in the way with him. He says, if you do not these things, he says, you will be cast out. Deliver, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. I want freedom. I love freedom. And I love spiritual freedom. And I don't want to be bound by Satan. I was bound by him one time. And it was not good. He binds you and He's got you constantly seeking things, but never coming to any great enjoyment. Never fulfilling peace within you because you are a prisoner of His and He's carrying you from one thing to the other. But with the peace of God with the freedom that he gives to us brings such great joy such great peace that we can have throughout eternity verily I say unto thee thou hast thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost fathering you have heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, That whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, Hath committed adultery already in his heart. Now listen to these things carefully, my friends. Today, adultery is rampant throughout our life, throughout our world, not in, and not in us. It, it should be, as he mentions in one of his other scriptures, that fornication or adultery there should not be once named among the righteous and among us. But he is talking to it in Christ. These things were going on all the way, have been since the beginning of time. Christ was here warning these people about adultery and how to, what a serious thing that it can be with people here upon the earth. He was warning them 2,000 years ago. We look upon it today and think that this is really bad, and it is. It is rampant. But I know that it was going on in those days and even the days before Christ. You can read about how it took place in many, many areas in the, throughout the Bible. But what he's saying here, he says, Now, you've been told, and it was written in the law of Moses and before even, Thou shalt not commit adultery. People don't look upon that as anything this day and time. And now look here and see what, what took place, what he said. He says, But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, 
hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He goes, takes it one step further back. He says, not just the physical act of that, but if you look upon that woman, or that woman look upon that man with lust in their eyes with that, lust in their mind, lust in their heart, he said, you've already done the same thing. You've committed adultery in your heart. And as we go through and we see and we hear throughout our land also of how pornography is destroying people. And I've heard that it is throughout the, the Christian community. It is greatly throughout the Christian community of pornography is. And all that goes right on back to that anyone involved in that is doing nothing more but committing adultery. Under the Word of God. Under the Word of Jesus Christ. He says if you're looking upon that woman with lust, then you're doing nothing more. You're committing that adultery in your heart. Friends, don't let Satan deceive you in these things. This is the Word of Jesus Christ. It's His Word. And we we had better believe and live in accordance with Him. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell." Now let's read, let's talk a little bit about what we just read there. He's saying it doesn't matter how close. You know, think about your eye. Our eye, we treasure our eyesight. I do. And I want to protect it with, and not let anything come in there. And if something got wrong with it, I'd want to try to find out what it was so that I could take care of it as much as possible. But if that eye was going to destroy the body, the rest of the body, because that eye had something terribly wrong with it, and it was to destroy it, I would want to get rid of that eye. Get rid of that eye so that the rest of the body can live. Now this is what he's talking about. Is that Now let's look at that spiritual part. There may be things so close to us here naturally. It could be our wife, it could be our son, our daughter, our job, our house, our car, our boat, or whatever it might be, naturally, that we are putting before, that it is a hindrance. It is a hindrance for us spiritually. And if we leave it there and we just keep on and on and on and on with it, letting that be first and foremost, then it's going to destroy us spiritually. Now, I'm not at all telling you that, yes, I've mentioned several things there, that you'd have to go and get rid of all those things. But you've got to let that be second. You've got to let that, that that is not an offense to Jesus Christ. If it is an offense to Jesus Christ, you better get it out of the way. And that's what he's talking about here. If it is an offense, it doesn't matter how close you have it to you, how much you love it, how much you want to be a part of it. If, it's a, if, if it is an offense to Jesus Christ and God the Father, you must get rid of it. Get it out of your life. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what he was talking about here. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from you. It, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish. It's profitable for you that spiritually, that you get that out of your life. Whatever it might be that is between you and Jesus Christ, get it out. So that then that whole spiritual body now can go on and see victory. And not be destroyed. It has been said. 
that whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Now Jesus Christ, he's going back to, and he's talking about the law that Moses had. He says, now this is the law, this is what was said back in those days. This is what Moses did, and he explains this. I don't believe that this was ever the law of God, but it was the law that Moses allowed the people to do. But God created man and he created woman. You know, we talked about that a lot last Sunday. About what God created. He created man, a perfect man. There was no blemish on him. And then he took that rib from, him, from that man. And he created the most beautiful woman that could be created. And he joined them together to be one. Adam even said, he says, you've taken this bone of mine, and she is flesh of mine and blood of, of mine, and therefore she, her name is woman. We are one. And then when we, re, when we become there, he says, now let's listen carefully. He is talking about people there. It has been said that whosoever shall put away his wife, one that he has married, one that he has promised to live together till death, Put away his wife, give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, now he's saying now, this is what I say, this is what Jesus Christ says. That whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now that... There's some things there that people will take and they change it all around. But I want you to listen carefully to what he said. He says, but I say unto you, now I say unto you, Jesus Christ, not what Mike says, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, I believe that he's, what he's saying there is that there is only one reason, real reason, that you could put away your wife. That you could have her and divorce her. And that is for adultery or for sexual immorality. Is the way we would look upon it today. And if you divorce her and you're causing her then, if she goes out and remarries, to commit adultery. Is the way I look at that, the way I read that. And whosoever shall marry her that is com divorced commits adultery. Remember again that he's saying that whoever, whosoever is divorced would be divorced because they had committed adultery. They had committed something wrong. And if I went out then and married that person that was in that condition because of that, then I would be causing that, that her that is divorced committed adultery. If I married that in that condition, that I would be in that same condition also because that is going against the word of Jesus Christ. Again, you have heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, neither by, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communications be yea, yea, and nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Let your words, let your, the things you say be the truth, whatever it might be. You don't have to go out and make long dissertations and things. Just let it be the truth. Whether it is yea or nay, let it be the truth and you stand by it. And you don't have to go out here and swear by this. You hear people talk about that, that they swear by God. They swear by this, that I'm telling you the truth. He doesn't say that you have to do those things. He says, just. Let your yea be nay and nay be nay in everything that you do. I believe I want to read a few, few other verses here. 
Let's go in this, this same book in the 19th chapter. There, we just read some there about the, what he talked about, about divorce. And I want to read some here. And he mentions it again over in this 19th chapter. We'll start there. He again, he is just telling people, giving them information. Start there at the third verse. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for man to put away his wife for every cause? They, want, they, they liked the things that Moses had just, they had, he had allowed them to just write a divorcement and to get rid of their wife. And he, said, he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Remember what he said, one flesh. And this is, goes all the way back. Here Jesus was doing nothing more but reminding the people about what God had done in the very beginning. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a right in a divorcement and to put her away? Now listen to what Jesus said about that. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away, doth commit adultery. And this to me gives me a little more understanding on what I was talking about there a minute ago. He says, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, sexual immorality, whatever. He says that is the only reason to do that. And he says, and if he, if he, if he does that, except for that, and he marries another, he is living in adultery by doing that. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away doth commit adultery. And I believe there again that he is talking about there, he's telling people that if, if one is put away because of that, and then you go out and you join yourself to that in marriage, then you would be committing adultery to that too. There is, there is things there that I would tell you that I don't have a perfect understanding upon it, but I know this. And let's do this. Let's read another, what Luke has. Each one of them, well, let's read what Mark says first about it. Mark talks about it too, but it, each one of the, the Gospels has something to say about divorce. And Mark makes it very clear the way he spells it out. Start here again at the fifth verse. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept, but from the beginning of the creation God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And in the house his disciples asked him again of this matter, and he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. He makes that very plain and clear to me. That if I go out and I just put away my wife and I go and marry another, I'm committing adultery against my wife. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Let's read here in Luke. Luke, 
I believe it's in the 16th chapter. Yes, in the 16th chapter of Luke. Starting at the 14th verse, And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among man is an abomination in the sight of God. And I believe that man has taken woman that was highly esteemed in the eyes of God when he created man and woman. And now it is highly esteemed among men. But man has low-rated the, the duty and the place of the woman. And he, he says there, ye, your, ye are justified, ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. God created woman in her beauty and in her likeness, or in his, the way he wanted her to be. And she had a place here upon the earth. But man has changed all those things. And now the way men look upon a woman and the way they abuse the use of a woman is an abomination in the sight of God. The way I look at that is the way he has looked upon that. The law and the prophets were until John since the time. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth unto it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. He says it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one small thing of God's law the way that God created this world to fail and it will not what is what God created and started in the very beginning is still today in effect whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. He just spells it out of how we should live our lives and what God's Word is. And we must live in, a, in you know, we talked in the very beginning here, the song that we sung, and I didn't know all about what we would be going over today had some things in my mind that we might talk about but when it said there believe upon his word and I talked about that in the very beginning of this service man doesn't believe upon this word anymore man believes that I can go out and I can live in however way that I want to live and I can deny the word of God and okay, I heard something recently that I believe that divorce, the percentages of divorce was greater in so-called Christians than it was throughout the people of the world. And do you see what God says against it? How can we proclaim these things? Now yes, if we have found ourselves in these conditions... There's a way God forgives. And God will help us through all of these things. He will take and forgive us for these things. But we still got to then live in accordance with His Word. We can't just continue on not living in His Word. There is a certain man, there is a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day 
And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid in the gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime thou receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted. And thou art tormented. The thing I want you to think about there is just what I just read. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest the good things. Remember in your lifetime how you receive the things of the flesh is what he's talking about. You receive the things that you thought was good. But Lazarus, the evil things, the things that people looked upon as evil is what Lazarus was able to get. He was able to survive upon the crumbs that fell from the master's table. The righteousness. And now, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from thence to you cannot Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. There will come a time, there will be a great gulf that is there between us and the wicked, the righteous and the wicked. Be sure that you are a part of that righteous. Be sure that we have that. that we are seeking Him and that we are filled with His righteousness. Don't be a part of the one that is looking over that you have been and received the things that you've looked upon as good, but God looked upon them as evil. Be searching the things that man looks upon as being evil and bad, but God looks upon them as good. The righteous looks upon it as good for their soul. Put your trust in Him. Believe on the Word and accept His grace. We'll bring this meeting to a close. We'll sing number 68. How beautiful heaven must be.
I'm longing to go to fair heavens to be with the happy and free to spend the long ages in singing how beautiful heaven must be. We've got that opportunity. Don't let Satan deceive you. Don't let Satan deceive you into anything that might encourage someone against his word. Don't be a part of Satan in anything that might encourage someone. Be that light that is set on that hill that is shining that others may be able to see and give God the glory. Amen to that. Let us pray. To God, our blessed God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, we come to you today. First of all, we just thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for the opportunity to know you through your Son, Jesus. We thank you for what he did here on the earth. And God, we beg for guidance in the upcoming days that we are able to discern your truths. And those that are struggling today to understand, to fill them with righteousness, fill them with your Spirit, so that they will be able to judge righteous judgment and will be able to discern the truths that you have laid out for us. Discern your Word as the truths of God. Help us to encourage one another and be with those that are struggling spirit naturally. And help them to just look to you and spiritually, to look to you in every single thing, knowing that you are there. And if we will just submit to you, you'll overcome all things for us. But to be mourning our spirit, that wicked spirit that can be in man, be mourning the weakness of that spirit in man, but know that your spirit, mourning the weakness in the flesh, but knowing that the spirit of God can overcome and it is strong and it is willing to work with whosoever will come to you. God, we just beg for guidance that your will be done. And you show us what to do with the things that you've entrusted into our hands that we can have eternal life with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.